as a function of a study. Thank you, Hamish, and thanks all of you for coming, and welcome. This is such an auspicious day. You don't know how long we've been working on this, and every time I've been through here, we, we started when we first looked at this space with quartz coming out the walls, and we talked about paint and rooms and everything, so it's to be here to see this is, is just wonderful. And when Hamish said that uh, you're being, this is being streamed out around the world, uh, that's very true because um, at, in my role, I consider myself to have the best job there ever was in the world because I get to work with all these extraordinary staff of the College of Global Studies of Arcadia University everywhere. And Hamish has, has 15 other, 20 other uh, directors watching uh, him open this center as well because we've all been working on this. Everybody's waiting for this, so it's, it's great. Uh, Arcadia University and the University of Edinburgh began a partnership in about the mid-70s, so we've been with the University of Edinburgh for about 35 years, and since that time we've sent students all over Scotland, but about 2,500 have, have studied on this campus. I really want to thank Kim Waldron, who's the University of Edinburgh Secretary, who understood and listened to us and helped us uh, form this center where we could have a confluence of scholars and researchers and students and staff and faculty uh, join us on a regular basis and she's worked very hard on our behalf to help make this possible. We also have some estate and building folks. Uh, Graham, For Graham McGrath and Allison Forrester Smith have helped us right along. I didn't come through here once where Allison wasn't in here helping us as well. So they worked very hard to help help make this help make this possible. I also bring our very best regards from Toby Oxholm, who's the 20th president of Arcadia University. We also managed to drag him through here in March when there were uh, cords coming out of the walls and Arcadia University had a preview program here that week. So he was here visiting those students and we had him in here also. Our board chair, Peggy Steele, and the chair of the International Programs Committee, Ted Wood, also have watched all this progress. They've been supporters of the college uh, for many, many years and are, are also very pleased that that this day has arrived. Lastly, I want to talk about Hamish, who uh, really we could count him as our founding director of this center uh, because he is our first full-time director here. And I have to tell you, as I've told everybody in Arcadia, there's not another space that's more Arcadia than, than this one, complete with the red and the gray and the red wall. But every, every time I was here, every conversation I ever had with, with Hamish, it was about the students. What are the students going to do here? What will they, how will they like this space? What will this happen? Where will this be? And so the lounge that's in the back, you have to have special, uh, a special thank you for Hamish on that one in the red wall because uh, that was very much his vision for, the, uh, for all of you to, to have such a space to study and learn and visit and... and be together. And the first day that uh, we, he, was got, he was in here, he called me to tell me that uh, there were students in here and you were having tea. And he, he was, he'd arrived. That was, was very nice. Uh, Karen and Emily have done a fabulous job with this and there's also Anna West who is now in Glenside who worked here for so many years and came back and forth as, as we were transitioning. So there's uh, people everywhere that have helped make this possible, and I bring welcome from all those folks and many more. Now I'm going to turn it over to our founding director, Hamish Thompson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. It's a, it's a delight to introduce uh, Professor David Clark as the speaker for tonight's inaugural lecture for our new center. Uh, Professor Clark has spent over 42 years in National Museums of Scotland in various roles. For the last 30 years, he served as the keeper of archeology span uh, of the National Museum of Scotland. Perhaps David's most important contribution to the portrayal of Scottish identity through the display of its material culture 
was in his role as head of exhibitions for the Museum of Scotland project. This, this project integrated the display of Scotland's early history into a newly built structure designed specifically to house and present Scotland's past up to the present day. This was opened in 1998 and Dr. Clark's vision has been shared by literally millions of visitors from around the globe and remains one of the most innovative museum exhibitions in part due to its use of contemporary architecture and art to display the ancient past. It's a truly remarkable display and anyone coming to Scotland should, should go visit the National Museum of Scotland, look at the, the, the ground two floors and that, that is, uh, that's thanks to um, David here. Dr. Clark has too many important publications to discuss in detail, so I'll limit myself to his most recent book, published less than two weeks ago, Hot Off the Press, co-authored with Alice Blackwell and Martin Goldberg. It's a lavishly illustrated book entitled Early Medieval Scotland, Individuals, Communities and Ideas. To understand a culture, we must look to its past. So, to launch Arcadia University's, the College of Global Studies, Edinburgh Centre lecture series, I introduce Dr. David Clark, who will be discussing why Scotland is so often absent from studies of Britain and Europe in the early medieval period. Um, I have to beg an apology because I'm I've written a script rather than ad-lib this because I had a feeling that I might go on beyond the allotted minutes if I would let myself to ad-lib. So I've rather stuck to a script. But um, <clears throat> before I start, I should say that the book that Hamish very generously just drawn to your attention, the title was not the title that the authors wanted, but what the museum wanted. <laughs> we wanted fragments of medieval, early medieval Scotland, which is a slightly different thing. Anyway, you will not, I imagine, be that surprised to learn that, my, that I don't think the answer to this, uh, this question is single and easy. And equally, that I don't think that the Scottish evidence is so poor and so sparse that it can offer nothing to wider studies of early medieval Britain and Europe. There are, it seems to me, three separate elements to be considered as we seek to explore the issues that are involved. The first, it needs to be demonstrated that Scotland is regularly absent from these wider discussions. Second, having demonstrated absence, we need to explore why this should be so. And third, it will be helpful to look at some examples of the areas where the Scottish evidence might usefully contribute to larger reviews. In other words, why Scotland's absence affects more than just our perception of its past. So let's turn first to the evidence that Scotland is regularly ignored in studies of early medieval Britain and Ireland. You'll be relieved, I hope, to know that I don't propose to take you through a catalogue of, um, <coughs> of works <coughs> for whom Scotland provides little or nothing of interest. And nor am I suggesting that specialist works look at in particular topics, works like, for example, Barbara York's The Conversion of Britain, 600 to 800, or the multi-authored Social Identity in Early Medieval Britain. I don't, I'm not suggesting that these works wholly ignore Scotland. Instead, what I'm principally concerned with are those works that aim to provide a serious synthesis of early medieval Britain and Europe. And I want to illustrate my point by looking at the work of two significant scholars, Chris Wickham and Robin Fleming. And I should say at the outset that I'm full of admiration for the breadth of scholarship that their works demonstrate and the provocative treatments they contain. But my choice was, of course, determined largely by how well the works of these scholars would make my central point. Uh, but also, and this is very important, they were appealing because they are historians who have shown themselves to be both familiar with and adept at using archaeological interpretation in their evidence. Archaeological evidence in their interpretations, I should say. 
Now this can't be said of most historians, so that Wickham and Fleming's skills and knowledge in this respect made Scotland's virtual absence from their works all the more surprising. So let's turn first to Chris Wickham and his major work, Framing the Early Middle Ages, Europe and the Mediterranean, 400 to 800. The, um, <clears throat> the first map in the book is one where, in the explanatory key, you'll notice Scotland, region not discussed in this book. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> So, in a volume of nearly a thousand pages, he can find no reason to include Scotland in, a broad, in his broad-ranging discussion. Nor is the situation much better in his other important work, The Inheritance of Rome, A History of Europe from 400 to 1000. Here in his introduction he says, and I quote, There is far less evidence for the early Middle Ages than the later sometimes so little that we can hardly reconstruct a society at all. Scotland is an example. And later on, in discussing the aggregation of political power in what he quaintly describes as outer Europe, he describes Scotland as the obscurest of all the states that he's considering. Now, of course, in both books, Wickham is considering the whole of Europe and the Mediterranean, and Scotland is very much on the northern fringes of that area. But Robin Fleming's book, Britain After Rome, Rise and Fall, uh, 400 to 1070, is altogether more tightly focused. It's a volume in the Penguin History of Britain, but its maps, shall I offer you here, um, his maps <coughs> don't really, aren't much more encouraging for the role of Scotland in her volume than those of Wickham were in his. In her introduction she says, <coughs> and I quote, I had hoped, for example, to focus less on the English, say, than on the Picts or the Welsh, since there is more material evidence for these two groups than textual. Now this promising comment even though this is a promising comment, even though it's immediately qualified with the statement that material evidence, like textual evidence, is uneven both across Britain and across time. And this continues to determine what we can write about. So how does Fleming's wish to focus more on Picts than English, by which I understand Anglo-Saxon, actually work out in practice? Well, the index tells us that Picts appear only 15 times in a book that runs to 450 pages, at least in the paperback edition. This might not matter if the majority of those, these involved a substantive discussion of aspects of the Picts, but this sadly is not the case. Instead, they appear only in short descriptive sentences like, and i give you an example, the 4th century witnessed persistent raiding by Picts and Scots, which accelerated as the century progressed, and the peace was punctuated four times by increasingly organised and damaging incursions. So that's your reference to the Picts. Indeed, some of these index entries are occasioned by, Frank, for example, a discussion of St Columba, who is incidentally described as having converted the Picts, and so therefore they make it into the index. Scotland only really begins to figure in the central discussion in this book with the appearance of the Vikings. It looks then as though Fleming's desire to give due weight to the Picts has foundered on what she described as the unevenness of both textual and material evidence. Yet historians working in Scotland, like uh, James Fraser uh, in this university, or Alex Wolfe at St Andrews, can produce volumes of around 400 pages each on early medieval Scotland. And it seems to me that this rather suggests that although the textual material evidence may be uneven, it's certainly not absent. What we appear to be <coughs> well, excuse me. We appear to be dealing with here are long established mental maps constructed around a dichotomy between Anglo Saxon England and Ireland that effectively excludes other areas from participation in and contribution to wider narratives. 
I noted earlier that this unwillingness to involve Scottish evidence in wider discussions was not characteristic of specialist academic studies. But the mental map I've just referred to is not wholly absent from the mindset of those conducting such studies. By way of example, let us look at the corpus of Anglo-Saxon sculpture. For reasons of which I am wholly ignorant, the decision was taken to restrict this project to sculpture in England, notwithstanding that it was sponsored, at least initially, by the British Academy. This meant that the, perhaps the finest example of Anglo-Saxon sculpture, uh, the cross at Rathwell in Dumfrieshire, will be excluded from this corpus along with some other notable pieces that have been found in Scotland. Now, I recognise that these decisions may well have been taken for sound practical reasons, although standing on the Scottish side of the border, it's not easy to understand what these might have been. But the same attitudes, without the support of practical necessity, appear to be present in other studies of, Anglo -Saxon, of the Anglo-Saxon presence in what is now Scotland. When David Rollison tells us, quotes, that the only really important high status object to have been recovered from pre-Viking Northumbria is the superb helmet from Coppergate in York, he may be only taking us into a semantic minefield. There's no doubt in the quality of this object, though he doesn't of course tell us what he means by important or high status in this context. Nevertheless, it seems to me that, uh, by most reasonable definitions, um, <coughs> the gold and garnet pyramid from Dalmeny in West Lothian, or the stud from garnet, gold and garnet stud from Markle in East Lothian, once formed part of important high-status objects. Rolson's remark is only credible if the key factor for his, his <coughs> generalisation is completeness. And that seems to me an extremely curious criteria to apply to archaeological finds. A related set of issues arises from Sam Lucy's consideration of burial rites in Northumbria, Northumbria from 500 to 750. The maps that she produces, here's one of them, um, don't extend across the present border. All burials, you see, only occur in England, not in Scotland. It could be reasonably argued that furnished graves are not found in Scotland, although the find from Dalmeny, these beads in a, in a kist, is best interpreted as an Anglo-Saxon grave. But the virtual absence of such graves in this part of Northumbrian territory surely requires some explanation in terms of Northumbrian burial rites. And so does the presence in this area of unfurnished long kissed burials with radiocarbon dates that suggest some of them were constructed when the area was under Northumbrian control. Now I've concentrated on Northumbria because <coughs> in this part of the discussion because it ought to be the area of Scotland that is most integrated into narratives extending further south. Yet even here we find the indirect influence of modern political boundaries. More generally, I hope that the examples drawn from Chris Wickham and Robin Fleming have convinced you that an argument can be made that Scotland is often absent, or largely so, in wider discussions of early medieval Britain and Europe. With that established, I would now like to go on to the second part and examine why Scotland is so often absent from these discussions. I've suggested in my consideration of Northumbria that the modern political border may have some background influence. In saying this, I don't want you to imagine that I'm involved in, with promoting a nationalist agenda, and nor do I think that taking Scotland as a whole, the position of the recent boundary, has been a factor of any importance. Instead, let's start by returning to the mental map that sees this area of Europe as largely composed of two major entities, Ireland, and eastern, central and southern England, that is the heartland of Anglo-Saxon England. This map has been in place for a long time without challenge. It's not hard to see how it's come about. For both areas, the early medieval period is intimately bound up with issues of national identity. For the Irish, at least since independence, this period has been regarded as a golden age 
Indeed, Peter Harbison has produced a book about material from this time entitled The Golden Age of Irish Art. And the state has regularly used images and material from this period as reflecting the quintessential essence of Irishness. Many of the key objects, which I'll give you just one, the Arda Chalice, are brought together in the National Museum in Dublin in a display entitled The Treasury. There is no doubt in my mind that the use of this title betokens much more than the fact that the display contains bejeweled objects of gold and silver. It also emphasises that these are the treasures of the state. Nothing could be more Irish than the art of these objects. A part of the power of the art is, it, is its links back to earlier periods of Ireland's past. By way of contrast, the material from Anglo-Saxon England draws its power from having no links to the past, from what Bruce Eagles has characterised as, quotes, a fundamental transformation of the material culture in the late 5th century. The art of these pieces has not acquired a central role in defining the English in the way that we see in Ireland. Their importance comes from the break with the past that they represent. They are at the core of the origin myth of the English. This too is reflected in a book title, one published a very long time ago by Dorothy Whitelock in an earlier Penguin history uh, in which she called it the beginnings of English society. In part, the importance of these two areas in studies of early medieval Britain reflect the dynamic quality of these central roles. But equally important is that both have rich textual and material culture assemblages. This is the unevenness of material and textual sources that Robin Fleming noted as the key constraint on the narratives we can attempt. So in a rather straightforward sense, the reason for Scotland being largely absent from these narratives <coughs> has seemed, to those who thought about it anyway, very straightforward. It has virtually no surviving textual sources, and its material culture has been regarded as but a pale reflection of that of England and Ireland. This view of Scottish material culture was similarly applied to much of its prehistoric objects. Those pieces that didn't conform to this model were dismissed as sui generis. Now it's certainly true that Scotland has few textual sources, and that outsiders wrote almost all of them. But as we've noted earlier, this hasn't stopped historians of early medieval Scotland from pr producing significant studies. But it's not the case that Scotland's material culture can be explained away as some pale derivative of that produced elsewhere. We've moved on a lot since the crudity of Abercrombie's early 20th century vision of beaker folk advancing steadily north from the south coast of England at a rate of some 50 miles a generation. But that model lives on in a more sophisticated guise in the minds of many. And of course, early medieval finds are so numerous and in some instances so spectacular in Ireland that it has long been the custom to describe as Irish any British find that cannot be labelled Anglo-Saxon. This is particularly so for objects of any quality. Many, the Irish in particular, still find it difficult to believe that such objects can have been made anywhere other than Ireland. Even though most scholars agree that the Book of Kells and possibly, and perhaps, the Book of Durrow were created on Iona, their presence today in Ireland enables them to be claimed as Irish art. Moreover, the essentially ethnic labelling of artefacts this essentially ethnic labelling of artefacts simplifies and disguises a much more problematic situation. Here is Leslie Alcott's description of the Hammerstone brooch. He doesn't actually say that he's talking about the Hammerstone brooch, but I'm absolutely confident that he was. <laughs> it's certainly a perfect fit. This is what he says. It's not difficult to imagine a brooch of ultimately Irish form embellished with both Celtic and Germanic motifs, being made in a Scotic workshop in a part of Dalriata, which was politically under Pictish control at the 
time. Now these comments aren't just based on the brooch itself, but they incorporate evidence from the excavations at Damad in Argyll. It's not essential that you sign up to the detail of this description in order to take from it two important messages. The first is that it's wholly inappropriate to characterise such a complex object through a simple ethnic label like Irish or Pictish. And second, we need to note that Alcock has constructed a description that does not give primacy to any of the individual elements that he's identified. It was not, I think, until the discovery of the silver hoard at St Ninian's Isle, I'm sorry for this picture, but there seems to be something about this hoard that paralyzes the photographers in the National Museum. <laughs> Um, so, you'll see, I, they can do the individual objects fine, as you'll see in a moment, but they just can't do the whole lot. Yeah. Anyway, it was not until the discovery of this silver hoard at St. Denis Isle in Shetland in 1958 that the idea that early medieval Scotland might have been able to produce its own distinctively styled objects began to take shape. Inevitably, the, sh the objects were labelled Pictish because the Picts represent the only certainly indigenous group in the melange that is early medieval Scotland. This hasn't, of course, been unchallenged in the case of particular objects. So Leslie Webster wants to see these two shapes, um, as from Mercia in the Midlands of England, um, <coughs> although the Hendersons refute this, seeing it as the products of a Shetland workshop a dispute that ignores entirely Alcock's implicit model of the importance of complexity in the interpretation of ornamental objects. But generally, the idea that these objects were produced in Scotland has been accepted. And the result has been that other objects, such as the Monymusk Reliquary, which moved from Ireland to Scotland, have been wrested from the ambit of Irish manufacture. The discovery also encouraged other finds of silver objects like that from Gold Cross in Bampshire or the lost hoard from Berger in Orkney to be similarly seen as Pictish. So if we can accept that Scottish material culture is not usefully seen as derivative, we have not to weigh one of the key explanations for Scotland's absence from wider narratives. The answer may lie with Scotland's failure to fit the paradigms that frame our interpretations. The early medieval period in Scotland is not seen as a golden age, such as has been claimed for Ireland, nor does the country experience an influx of new people comparable to the Anglo-Saxons in England. There are historical records suggesting the arrival of Irish immigrants in the West that established the Kingdom of Dariata. But this evidence is difficult to reconcile with the archaeological record that shows no evidence at all of such an event. There are virtually no incontrovertibly Irish objects in, from the area, and what there is could be explained by exchange as much as by movement of people. Even at the assumed royal site of Denad, the structures find their best parallels in eastern Scotland rather than in Ireland. Admittedly, we now believe that the plan is not the realisation of a single design, but the product of several separate building episodes. Nevertheless, no single part of the structures at Denad find a ready comparison in Ireland. Ewan Campbell has suggested that the records of Irish immigration are no more than, quotes, origin legends of a type common to most people of the period, constructed to show the descent of a ruling dynasty from a powerful mythical or religious figure. Nor are Scotland's differences with, uh, England and, with Ireland and England restricted to these aspects. All three had experience of Rome, although in each case that experience was very different. Rome remained effectively Rome free, although I think they are just wavering a little as to whether the Romans did ever put their feet on the blessed soil or not. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> but certainly no realised threat of military occupation. England, on the other hand, was a fully established Roman province for some 350 years. Scotland fell between these two extremes. As far as we can tell, we can tell it, the experience, experience the Roman army as an army of occupation 
on only three occasions, lasting in total only around 50 years. Even then, although Agricola seems to have reached the Murray Firth, his stay was very short and much of the country experienced no Roman occupation of any consequence at all. Of course, the threat of Rome was ever present in southern Scotland. But the experience and legacy of Rome was very different from that of England. It has been argued that the presence of Rome encouraged the formation of larger political groupings. <clears throat> that from the third century we know of as the Picts. Indeed, most of the limited textual evidence in the third and fourth century relates to raids by the Picts and other groups into the Roman provinces. And the normative assumption is that the Picts became progressively more cohesive, politically at least, in post-Roman Scotland. It's possible, it's possible, however, to turn this interpretation on its head. In a fascinating study of the Chinese nomad frontier at approximately the same period, Thomas Barfield has shown that the Mongolian nomads became strong and stable politically through extorting huge amounts of wealth from Han China. Pillage and tribute payments from the Chinese were among the important means by which this wealth was accumulated. There are clear parallels here with groups like the Picts, who pillaged the Roman province from time to time, but at others were the recipients of payments, largely as far as we can tell in silver coin and bullion, to stop such attacks. What is important here is that the, in the Chinese situation, when China collapsed into political anarchy and economic depression, it destabilized the unity of the steppe polities beyond the empire's border. It doesn't seem too fanciful then to suggest that the collapse of Rome's rule in Britain might have had a similar destabilizing effect on groups like the Picts in Scotland. Whether or not this happened, it's clear that Scotland that in Scotland in early medieval times reflected a continuity from later prehistory that, would, but that had been destroyed in England by the Roman and Anglo-Saxon experience. It is this disjuncture that has made Scotland difficult to incorporate into current narratives. It now remains finally to explore why we should be seeking to overcome these difficulties in order to find a place for Scotland in our reviews of early medieval Britain and Europe. In essence, the answer we, that we provided for Scotland's absence from such studies, that the material does not fit the paradigms that frame our analysis, is the reason why Scotland should make a bigger appearance than it does. Let me illustrate this with a simple example. When brooches are found in Anglo-Saxon graves, they are seen as gender indicators. That is, they're always assumed to be women's graves. Whereas, <coughs> Their occurrence in Scotland occasions no such view. Uh, this is the hoard from Cluny in Prussia. But brooches in Scotland are assumed to be worn by both men and women, um, as suggested by the Irish laws. Indeed, the large number of brooch moulds found at sites like Donad make brooches the most important object being made at these places. And this might cause us to reconsider our social models if all these brooches were being made exclusively for the use of women. But I want to discuss my general point by looking briefly at two different aspects. First of all, settlement sites and metalworking, and secondly, sculpture. The clearest form of early medieval settlement consists of enclosed places. This is in Scotland, of course. Fortified hilltops and coastal promontories and cranogs or lake dwellings. Both types have been generally viewed as royal or aristocratic residences. Some can certainly be identified with sites mentioned in the uh, written sources for the period and the secular examples are regarded as royal sites. So this is Leslie Alcock's um, <coughs> the mention of the written in the written sources led Orcott to characterize them as early historic sites and this is his map of them. The fortified examples are sparse in number and largely restricted to Argyle and the central and eastern lowlands. There are none north and west of the Great Glen, nor even apart from a scatter along the east coast, are there any in southern Scotland. Even when we add 
Elizabeth Alcock's <coughs> catalogue of enclosed places, there are still some significant blanks, particularly as the numbers make the map seem more populated than it really is. Moreover, some of the sites have produced only small numbers of objects or features that place their occupation in the period AD 500 to 800. So their high status is founded principally upon their architectural form. Now our normative view of early kingship in Britain at this period is that it was peripatetic with the king and his followers moving from one royal centre to another, consuming the agricultural tribute as they went. Too few sites have been identified in England to enable this model to be tested archaeologically there, but the range of Scottish sites appear to offer better possibilities. Of course, even here there are real difficulties, of which the most important is that many of these sites are located on acidic soils that do not preserve the animal bone assemblage. Nevertheless, if we just use the crude distribution maps, it seems clear that there are areas like Argyll, Perthshire and the Lothians where such a system might be workable. Equally though, there are areas where the absence of sites make this model look implausible. I'm thinking of areas like Angus, Easter Ross and the eastern coastal plain of Sutherland. And these are all areas with substantial collections of sculpture that one might think betokened royal and aristocratic patronage. What the Scottish evidence might bring to any discussion of this topic is that the model might not have the universal application that is often assumed in general surveys. But equally, it might prompt us to define with greater precision what patterns in the archaeological record we might expect from such activities. Many of these sites have produced evidence of non-ferrous metalworking. Indeed, such metalworking evidence has on occasion been invoked as one of the key indicators of a royal and aristocratic site. The model here is that the king and his closest followers control metal workers in order that they may use the products of their labours in gift exchanges that are part of the processes involved in securing the allegiance of the wider community. It's a fairly crude model, but it basically seems to have worked. You know, I give you something and you're therefore obligated to give me something back. Usually your body in a fight. <laughs> <clears throat> there is, it seems to me, a real weakness in this idea in the assumption that all non-ferrous metalworking involves high-status product. Producing a small copper alloy pen, pin does not involve the same craft skills as the creation of pieces like the Hunterston brooch that we saw earlier, and we should not pretend that they're part of a single spectrum. Scotland is particularly rich in metalworking assemblages and consequently offers the opportunity to determine whether our models will stand up to scrutiny. Although the, <clears throat> the distribution of these non-ferrous metalworking assemblages shows a reasonable match with that of, the, that of the enclosed places, there are significant discrepancies. Some are occasioned by the inclusion of finds from monastic sites, which weren't on the other map, but the real difference is in the Western Isles, <clears throat> where Orcock could identify only two enclosed sites, both of those in my view are dubious. Andy Hield has identified eight sites here with possible metal work in debris, and some, like Alan Olivat, come from abandoned buildings now being reused for the noxious processes of metalworking. At others, <coughs> such as Noca Condalach, elaborate silver brooches comparable to those being made at those found at St. Ninian's Isle in Shetland were being made. Yet these sites have nothing about them architecturally to link them with high status occupation. As with peripatetic kings, the model of royal control over metal workers might work in Argyll, but it's less convincing elsewhere. So finally, let me turn to stone sculpture. Stone sculpture is found throughout Britain and Ireland in the early medieval period. But Scotland is exceptional in having a significant amount of sculpture, I wouldn't say so, I mean, I probably mean unique, 
Anyway, certainly exceptional. Now, a significant amount of sculpture that is not Christian in its motifs, though it may have been created as a response to the emergence of Christianity and the changes that inevitably accompanied it. This is the first new sculpture to be erected in the landscape for some two millennia, and some of it reuses stones from earlier monuments, such as stone circles or standing stones. So this is the um, stone Avalemna, one of the stones of Avalemna, which has earlier um, cut marks on it from um, prehistoric use of this. It was originally a prehistoric standing stone. However distorted the understanding of those monuments, that is, stone circles and standing stones, may have been in the early medieval period, their use in this way, and the fact that the new stones were in their overall form, mimicking these earlier mon monuments, suggest continuity not easily paralleled elsewhere in Britain. Yet at the same time, these monuments were remarkable innovations, marking the landscape in a new and permanent way. It's not immediately clear where the craft skills associated with inscribing symbols on rocks actually came from. And this issue of emergent skills occurs again, though perhaps less opaquely, with other groups of sculpture that I want to look at, the cross slabs of eastern Scotland. When in the early 8th century, Necton asked the abbot of Wyrmouth Jarrow to send him masons to build a church in the Roman style, that is, of dressed stone, he was clearly identifying a lack of skills among his own craftsmen. But what exactly did he get from these masons from Northumbria? For there, like the rest of England, stone churches seem to have been created from reused Roman stone, tile and brick. But in southern Pickland there were no remains of Roman buildings from which to salvage these materials. This meant that quarrying skills would have been an essential part of providing the raw materials both for the churches and for the cross slabs. But we have no evidence for quarrying elsewhere in early medieval Britain. What is clear is that the cross slabs are created on dressed slabs of stone, presumably using skills acquired in the building of stone churches in the Roman style. More important than this though, is the presence on the cross slabs of images of the community that erected them. Moreover, they are depictions of the community created by some of their own members. Among the avowedly religious symbols of the new Christian beliefs are numerous images of human figures. And so I'm really interested in the top, not the bottom, but it's sort of a bit biblical. <laughs> They are not attempts at portraiture as we understand the world. Some might well be religious symbols in their own right, but their interest for us is that these human portrayals are expressed in terms of contemporary values and fashions. They are, in the effective ab absence of surviving texts written in Scotland, the only contemporary views from the inside rather than the outside that we have. It's the first time we have any contemporary images, and they are without real parallel anywhere else in Britain. Now, of course, it's not a comprehensive picture of the community. There are, for example, no slaves and no peasants. The images are overwhelmingly male, making an important, if unsurprising, statement about who had power and status at that time. The figures were never intended to illustrate a balanced cross-section of the community. Instead, they show selected aspects of life in early historic Scotland. Essentially, they reflect the upper echelons of a hierarchical social structure where power is shared between secular and religious leaders. Among the images, clerics are prominent, but the majority of figures appear to be secular. For both, the emphasis on the shared styles of the community and not a trumpet, trumpeting of individuality. Because of this, we can be more confident that the values and styles portrayed are those embraced and acknowledged by the wider community. The dominant impression is of power shared by religious and secular groups. A 
Among the figures are those bearing arms, normally a sword, a sword, shield and spear or lance. These are the same status patterns that we see projected in Anglo-Saxon burials. Without these images on the stones, much of this detail would be unconfirmed in the archaeological record because Scotland does not have comparable furnished burials. Indeed, the images give us access to features we are unlikely ever to see in the archaeological record. For example, this is part of this <coughs> fragmentary slab from the Brook of Bursa in Orkney. It's not demonstrably part of a cross slab, but the carvings in low relief link it with those slabs. At the bottom of the slab, as it now survives, are these three warriors, one behind the other. Each, as you see, carries a shield and a spear and a sword, has wearing a sword. <clears throat> the front figure clearly displays his higher status. His hairstyle is more elaborate. His spear is longer with a larger head. His shield is decorated and his coat has a fringe at the bottom. This much would have been obvious to the viewer, especially if the sculpture was originally coloured. Yet there are less obvious suggestions of distant difference in status between the middle and final figure. And I have to say that after, I didn't notice this till I put it up this afternoon, it was too late to change it. What, the, what my colleague who made this PowerPoint has done is very kindly, you know, made this nice. Yeah, so he's kept all the feet as low as he can. But actually, of course, it's the stone is slight. It should have been twisted slightly up because this guy's higher up than this guy who's higher up than this guy. It doesn't appear that way on the picture. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Both of the two guys at the back look very similar. They share the same subdued hairstyle, or perhaps they're wearing you know some kind of cap that covers their hair. Um, but the middle figure has an elegant beard, while the final figure is clean-shaven. This is probably not to be interpreted as personal choice. The hairstyle of the front figure, that also has a beard, suggests that treatment of hair on the, on the face and head was used to denote status, or at least age and experience. It, may presumably, it was presumably subject to strict rules or conventions though these may only apply to artistic depictions and not be a reflection of everyday practice. This is also seen in other images. Further, the final figure on the Bersi stone stands at a lower level than the, other, than the first two figures. This is a conscious choice on the part of the sculpture as nothing about the shape or surface of the stone has forced him into placing the third figure at a lower level. This may be, of course, reading too much into small differences. <clears throat> but the treatment of the front figure suggests that the expression of rank was usually an understated affair, differentiating certain individuals in small ways, but at the same time em emphasising membership of a wider community. We have no way of knowing whether such understatement was characteristic of all levels of society, but it seems unlikely. Instead, it, seen, it needs to be seen as a device to promote the coherence of the ruling group in the face of images of it painted in the, by the text as fractured, aggressive and competitive. Now, I hope that these two examples <coughs> have shown you that these are things where Scotland could make a contribution to our wider understanding. And I hope I've, at the end of all this, that I've convinced you of three things. First, straightforwardly, that Scotland is often absent from wider reviews. Second, that its absence is rooted in its failure to conform to long-standing paradigms that have dominated the way we view events in these islands at this period. And third, and most important, that Scotland's material culture could enrich the narratives we tell about this period. Thank you very much.
this might be sort of a foolish question and sort of asking you to predict the future, but um, with sort of popular, popular is not the right word, but um, the idea of Scottishness and devolution and, you know, things like as simple as brave, things like that, sort of, there's a popular culture element of it. Have you seen academia moving towards including Scotland more, or is there any, do you think that could impact? Um, I have to say, you know, that over 40 years, I haven't really noticed any significant change. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could go, when I first joined the museum, you could go south and stand up and speak, and, you know, you could see this audience out there thinking, God, he's talking about Scotland. I don't have to bother about this. And their eyes, you know, they sort of glaze over, and, you know, and I don't see any difference most of the time when I go south now. But, yeah, I still think that people think, Ah, oh, it's a long way up there, you know, it's not really to do with us. But I think that, in a sense, you know, the energy has to come from us. Yeah, Scotland has to be the people that we have to try and force ourselves into, yeah, into the mainstream. They're waiting for these guys down south or in Ireland to say, hey, they were doing things in Scotland, really interesting, they're never going to do it. You know, they like the way things are, I think, by and large. So I think we've got to make the case. And, um, and obviously, there is a, you know, you can't deny there's an over, there's something over the top, which is around the current politics of Scotland and independence or not having independence, things like that. Yeah. Because, you know, you know, when devolution happened, yeah, the first, um, the first Scottish government was led by Donald Dewar, but was a, a, a mixture of Labour and the Lib Dems. And they signed their agreement in the, the then very new Museum of Scotland. Yeah, they wrapped themselves in the past. Yeah, no question at all. And all politicians in Scotland do that all the time. I mean, not just in Scotland, but lots of other places. Yeah. And so, Yes, it's going to be cut, you know. There is a danger that we're, our academic push in to cease to give Scotland a bigger place in, for instance, early medieval Britain and Europe, will be seen as reflecting nationalist agenda when it, you know, at least for me, it's not at all. Um, yeah, do you think that, that Scottish archaeologists and historians themselves are really partly to blame for this themselves because um, and I'm taking it back to the national agenda because in England um, and in Ireland there's a strong sense of their own identity and in, 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 in the research whereas in Scotland I think maybe historically there's been a case of looking for parallels with England or with Ireland rather than looking at themselves and their own identity. Well, it's all, always, you know, all small nations, if you look at sort of identity issues, you know, are prone to define themselves as not like their big next door neighbor. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the principal ways they define themselves. Um, but the, I, I think there's a, there are a number of problems about, you know, in England there are a lot more archaeologists. So what you get is, you get critical mass in terms of discussion and, yeah, the promotion of agendas. In Ireland, you know, they have the state standing beside them. You know, I mean, we don't have anything like the Discovery Program. Yeah, where they put the, you know, Charles Hockey, God bless him, you know, put in, you know, millions. Probably illegally. Yeah, but anyway, anyway, that's not the point. They, they benefited greatly from it. And in Scotland, we don't have either. We don't have a, um, a lot of... Um, uh, support from government. You know, curiously, I mean, it is curious to me how little the SNP seem to feel that the past is of any consequence at all. Um, but the, and also we have very few, you know, so, well, how do we all know? You know, the number of people that are working on early medieval Scotland, you know, you, I mean, okay, you get beyond more than one hand, but, you know, I'm not sure you get beyond two hands. And that's just not a big enough group to, yeah, 
to generate the kind of energy that we need. So in one sense, we're, we're always struggling because we don't have enough people. We just don't have enough voices to, yeah, to create enough noise. An example would be like kettles itself, where it's not been claimed historically by the Scots at all. No. Because perhaps they don't have an agenda. They've, they've been working to a British agenda. Well, it's actually been aligned that way. Yeah, I, I, own, I know, but you know, actually, Iona has figured quite a lot in the in Scottish politics, in, as in the agenda. I mean, you know, John Smith was buried in Iona. Yeah, I mean, in, there aren't, you know, these aren't. Uh, so, the, it is very curious that that Kells has just been dropped off the end of this. So, I, you know, Iona is still, yeah. The, the sort of burying places of the Scots kings, but that's not, yeah, to some extent, and it keeps that agenda, but earlier, doesn't seem to work at all. I don't know why. Do you think that popular culture's kind of obsession with like Celtic history, can sort of like breathe, mm -hmm. is helpful as far as putting Scotland on the map yeah. its history on the map, or unhelpful in that it's becoming widely stereotyped? Well, it is already what it seems to be widely stereotyped, so these guys aren't doing us any harm. And, you know, and I remember when we, you know, when we did the, we're doing the Museum of Scotland, and I remember Tom Devine saying, you know, you guys have really got to face up to this Braveheart <laughs> stuff, yeah? Um, and, you know, for a lot of people that was, you know, Mel Gibson was the true, the true, yeah, uh, representation of, of William Wallace, yeah? and um, so I think, I actually think these are good, you know, in the sense that they bring the past and some of these issues, however stereotyped, into, yeah, a wider domain, and that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think that you know, it's better that than we than nobody chooses to make a film ever about any of this stuff, yeah. Or, you know, or we go down the Brigadoon route, yeah? I mean, which was, you know, another side of, oof, yeah? yeah. Is there a, a, a lack of um, a textual record, comparatively with Scotland, compared to other countries? And if so, do you think that that is something that feeds into the lack of a, the treatment yeah. of the material content? No, there's no question, I think, that uh, there is a, first of all, you know, a really big lack of textual material. So that where Scotland, and what we now call Scotland, is discussed in the record in the early texts, it's always somebody outside. You know, it's it's guys in an Irish monastery writing animals, or it's yeah, it's people like Bede or yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah. So, or earlier, it's classical writers. So, you know, there aren't. We don't have the inside story put it that way, to balance up against this. So, um, and I think that has been a really, a really big problem, you know, the absence of these records. Um, you know, as in, because most of these big surveys are still written by historians, not by archaeologists. And so therefore, and even though Fleming and Wickham do use archaeology, and I think use it pretty well, um, they still they still come to it with a mindset about you know they still believe because they've been brought up in an education system which says text is prime. You know we've all been educated to believe that. Yeah, you know this anything else is not quite as good as what someone's put on a page. And so you know the absence of that I think has been uh, a very important factor. For Scotland, in terms of it being seen as not quite important, but also the agenda that we were talking about, the idea that Scotland was seen itself as part of Britain, particularly in the 19th century, when you know they wanted to be North Britain. Yeah, they didn't. They you know they wanted that kind of world. Um, they didn't want to make themselves too distinct. Although there were, you know, certainly in Scottish archaeology, there were trends of uh, Scottish nationalism, you know, running in people like my predecessor, Joseph Anderson, in the National Museum. You know, he definitely had a national agenda. There's no question in my mind about that at all. 
But I think in general terms, in the 19th century in particular, the lack of text coupled with this link to, yeah, we're part of a wider Britain, made it, you know, well, it was kind of the same kind of thing, wasn't it, as made teaching of Scottish history not actually happen in the schools, where, you know, they taught British history, i.e. English history, and so, you know, I mean, uh, all of that was part of, uh, part of that kind of thing, and I think, yeah, so it's, the lack of text has not helped at all. Thank you. Thank you very much.